In a recent interview, SpaceX President Gwyn Shotwell posed a simple question. Why can't we build one rocket every day? Or at least it sounds simple, but one rocket a day is an absolutely furious pace of production for a rocket of any class. It's unheard of. And when we factor in that Shotwell is not talking about just any rocket, she means the Starship Super Heavy vehicle, by far the largest and most powerful rocket ever built. That starts to sound like just plain madness, but Gwyn Shotwell isn't mad. That's Elon Musk's job. She's famously practical in her approach to spaceflight. So could SpaceX really build one Starship per day? And how would they do that? This is the Space Race. When Gwyn Shotwell recently spoke at the annual Commercial Space Transportation Conference in Washington, D.C., the obvious focus of the discussion was firmly on the Starship launch program. This was only a day before SpaceX was set up to fire 33 Raptor engines for the very first time, and Shotwell did an excellent job of establishing expectations for the soon-to-come orbital test flight of the Starship, telling reporters to, quote, Keep in mind, this first one is really a test flight, and the real goal is to not blow up on the launch pad. That is success. But she was also pretty quick to turn attention away from the Firefly excitement of the first launch attempt and put focus on her company's long-term vision for Starship. Shotwell said, There's a lot of little things to get done, especially because we weren't really focusing on the orbital ship, we were focusing on the production systems that will build the ship. We know how to get to orbit. This is what we mean when we say that Gwyn is the practical mind at SpaceX. Of course, Starship will get to orbit eventually. It might take a couple of tries to accomplish that, which will seem like a big deal in the short term. But this is all trivial compared to what Starship means for the future of SpaceX and human spaceflight overall. Here's Shotwell's full quote. Why can't we build a rocket every day? That's what we are focusing on with Starship, is attacking every part of the production process to be able to build lots of these machines. And this is just not the kind of language that you would ever hear from the head of any legacy aerospace company. Let's just try and get some perspective here. The closest comparable rocket to Starship is NASA's Space Launch System. The SLS design requires components from Boeing, Northrop Grumman, Lockheed Martin, and Aerojet Rocketdyne, all of which are manufactured at different points around the United States and then moved cross-country to be assembled together. The best that they can muster from the SLS is one rocket per year at a cost of around $4 billion per launch. And now SpaceX is flexing that they could build a bigger, better rocket every day of the week how could that even be possible? Starship is literally built different. There is no other rocket that uses the same material or construction method that SpaceX is perfecting at Starbase. In the original concept design, Elon Musk had wanted to use carbon fiber for the Starship hull, which makes sense in the abstract because carbon composites are both incredibly strong and incredibly lightweight material. But in practical terms, this method didn't pan out. For one, the massive diameter of the Starship makes it a poor candidate for carbon fiber. The most likely construction method for this would be to spin the body on a machine like a lathe while tightly wrapping layers of carbon. Now, imagine the size of a lathe required to spin a 69 meter long, 9 meter diameter wide rocket booster. And then it would need to be cured in an oven to harden, where, again, the size just doesn't work. For two, even if they could build a rocket from carbon fiber, the material does not take very well to high heat. Anything above 400 degrees Fahrenheit to 200 Celsius, and it starts to break down. The heat of re-entry into Earth's atmosphere can reach 3000 degrees Fahrenheit or 1600 degrees Celsius. So a carbon fiber rocket would require an incredibly thick heat shield to have any chance at making it back down to Earth in one piece. So thick, in fact, that the heat shield would totally negate any weight savings from using this material in the first place 
making the high cost of $150 per kilogram a complete waste of money. That is why Elon quickly changed his focus to stainless steel as the perfect material for his starship. At a cost of just $3 per kilogram, stainless steel has a natural heat tolerance of up to 1600 degrees Fahrenheit or 850 degrees Celsius, meaning that it doesn't require very much additional shielding to survive re-entry. So when you combine the mass of the body and heat shield, a stainless steel rocket is comparable or even lighter than a carbon fiber rocket. So SpaceX had their material, but they still needed to work out their method. If we look at close-ups of the very earliest Starship prototypes, they look absolutely janky as hell. Like a high school shop class put these things together. Not that it mattered at the time, everyone knew that they were probably just going to explode and they did. The basic concept for Starship building has always been more or less the same. You take sheets of cold rolled stainless steel and form them into nine meter diameter rings. Then you stack those rings one on top of the other until you get the necessary height for a rocket, obviously with some variation on ring design for different segments of the ship and booster. In the early days, each ring was constructed from four individual sheets of 301 stainless steel at 4.5 millimeters thick. They were arc welded together using a flux core process to form single pieces, which were then stacked and welded to create the first prototype hull. This did not work. The Starship Mark I exploded during its first pressurization test. For their next iteration, SpaceX swapped out 301 stainless steel for the 304L variety, opting for one long sheet at a thickness of 3.6 millimeters. Now, instead of welding each ring four times, they were down to one single bond per ring, and they also upgraded that process to tip-tig welding, which produces the cleanest and most uniform results. Now, the only section of the ship that uses multiple segments is the nose cone, right where the ship begins to taper down to a point. On the inside of the Starship hull, there are going to be stainless steel beams called stringers. These run vertically across the rings and help to support the weight of the metal at the top and bottom sections of the rocket. The middle area of both the ship and booster are occupied by the propellant tanks, liquid oxygen storage on the bottom, and liquid methane on the top. These tank sections are divided internally by dome-shaped inserts that are also made from stainless steel sheets welded together in a very similar fashion to the outer nose cone. So just by improving their welding technique and adjusting the raw materials, SpaceX has already got the Starship hull looking much better and getting easier to manufacture. But they are still not done here. The secret to scaling this production up to the extreme volume that Gwyn Shotwell was talking about is going to be automation. SpaceX hasn't automated the Starship building process yet, but that's likely because they haven't reached a final design. As they are still iterating through different changes to the ship and booster, that's still easier to do by hand. But once they get the exact specifications of a ship and booster set in stone, that's likely when they bring in the robots. Much like what you see in a Tesla Gigafactory, SpaceX will transition Starship production over to robotic laser welding, where an army of machines will connect stainless steel rings and panels together on a fully automated production line, which could easily scale up to one complete rocket per day. The engines and related components are actually going to be the most difficult aspect of producing rockets at this high volume though, and SpaceX has a Raptor engine factory in McGregor, Texas, where they are currently targeting one engine every 24 hours. We've actually made a video all about that process on our other channel, the Tesla Space. You can check that out after, I'll leave a link in the description. So one Raptor per day is extremely high volume for a rocket engine, but each Starship and Super Heavy stack requires 39 of those engines to be launch ready. That's a lot of engines to build in one day, probably too many. And that's why I think when Gwyn says one rocket per day, she means the upper stage ship section and not the super heavy booster. The ship only requires six engines and maybe nine for some higher capacity applications. The number of boosters required in the long run is going to be much lower than the ships because the boosters always come back down immediately following the launch and can be reused in a matter of hours. But the ship will not always be coming back. The whole point of Starship is that it can fly long duration missions to the moon and Mars, and even deep into the solar system. 
So, if you want to maintain a very high launch cadence, and SpaceX is going to need that to achieve their high-level goals, like colonizing Mars, then you need a lot of ships. Elon Musk was asked on Twitter in January how many starships SpaceX is looking to build this year in 2023. Elon replied, about five full stacks. So, that's likely the fastest that they can go right now with the infrastructure they have and still hand welding the steel sections. Five orbital launches per year is also the number of attempts that SpaceX was granted by their FAA Environmental Impact Review of Starbase Texas. During a TED Talk interview about one year ago in April 2022, Elon said that he expects Starbase can reach one ship and booster every month with the capacity that they have now, and that could grow to eventually manufacturing a Starship every 72 hours. SpaceX is currently building a whole new Starship factory at their second launch site on Cape Canaveral, Florida. This is going to be around the same size as the rocket production area at Starbase, essentially doubling the capacity for building Starships. While Starbase is likely to continue to serve as a launch site for SpaceX internal missions like Starlink deployments, the Cape Canaveral launch site is more likely to take over as the primary hub for Starship commercial flights and government contracts. SpaceX already has enough land available at the Cape to double the footprint of their production space. So, if you take Elon's prediction of one ship every 72 hours at Starbase, then triple that with extra capacity at the Space Coast, then you end up with one ship every 24 hours. Probably not a coincidence. So, how many Starships do you think SpaceX can build this year? Will we ever see the fleet of 1,000 flying to Mars and back? Drop your theories down below. Meet us back here every week for more updates on everything aerospace industry and interstellar exploration related. Make sure to give the video a thumbs up today if you liked it, that really helps us out for real. And subscribe to the Space Race for more videos just like this. We do one long form essay and one news update every week. And if you'd like more, we've got two more on the screen for you right now.